Amen. Let's go ahead and go to John chapter 16 tonight. John chapter 16. Uh, Lord willing, in the next few weeks, I'm just going to kind of see what happens and where this goes, but I'm probably going to be preaching a few messages that's kind of geared towards a certain crowd, I guess you could say. And um, if, if, you know, a lot of you, you know, you probably don't go around to a lot of the conferences. You might not follow everything that goes on in the Baptist world. But, you know, as a pastor, I'm interested in what's going on in Baptist churches. And I pay attention to things. And, you know, you kind of watch trends and you see directions that people are going. And one of the things with me, I am, I'm constantly amazed and I'm blown away at doctrine that's being taught in Baptist churches. And some of the preachers that are out there, the things they are getting away with preaching in pulpits in Baptist churches, and I'm just like, how can this be? You know, this is stuff that people stood against for years. Some of this stuff, it's so clear in the Scriptures, yet nobody seems to care. Nobody bats an eye when this kind of craziness is preached. And it's like, you know, where is this stuff coming from? And, you know, and in my observation, I could be wrong on this thing. It seems like when it comes to in the, in the area that I'm from, you know, in Illinois, a lot of your independent fundamental Baptist churches, when you look at kind of the, uh, I guess you could say the behavior and the directions everybody's going, just a lot of the, I don't know, stuff that's not even necessarily bad, but just a lot of the culture in the church, it's kind of being influenced by like the West Coast you know, Baptist College or Lancaster Baptist College, that crowd out West. And that crowd is just, they're kind of being influenced by the new evangelicals. And a lot of the new evangelical stuff is coming into Baptist churches. You know, all this stuff that goes on where they're always bringing in lost people and honoring them, you know, having the mayors come in and all this community junk. This, you know, that's from the new evangelical crowd. And it's coming into fundamental Baptist churches. And it seems like it's those bigger places like that that introduce it. But I've listened to some of the preaching and the stuff they do out there. And, and as far as their doctrine goes, I never really hear any doctrine. They, they don't teach a lot of doctrine out there. And, but then at the same time, I'm hearing all this crazy doctrine coming into fundamental Baptist churches. I'm like, where is it from? And I'm to, I personally think it's from these crazy southern camp meetings is where this stuff is coming from. Those guys still try to preach doctrine down there. But it's bad doctrine. And I, I love Southern preaching. I do. I love to listen to a you know, redneck just get up there and just cut loose. Let me tell you, I, I love it. But unfortunately, that crowd down there, the Bible Belt, as they used to call it, or as we call it now, the Schofield Bible Belt, has been just, I mean, it is just completely being apostatized and just the most crazy false doctrines. I believe it's coming from there. And that's where they have all the big camp meetings. Down south, you know, Baptist is royalty down south. Have you ever seen the way they treat the Catholic priests, you know, around here? You know, that's the way the Baptist preachers get treated down there. And they are, because everybody's Baptist down there. You know, by name. But not by practice and not by doctrine, but they've got the big churches. The big churches are all Baptist down in the south. And so people look at that and they see, wow, you know, they from up north, you know, in Catholic territory, where it's hard to build a big church, they go and they'll travel down south to this big camp meeting. They see these gigantic churches and they see all this that's going on. Like, man, these people must know their stuff. Man, the Lord's sure doing a great work here. Lord's sure doing a great work. And why do they say that? Not because the soul's getting saved, but because of their buildings that they have. And they get, they get you know, mesmerized by these things. And so they assume what these people must be teaching is true, but nobody looks it up in the scripture. And I want to deal with, I, I want to deal with some of the just crazy foolishness, just the bad doctrine that I believe is coming from that crowd because I'm hearing about this stuff. And the, the, doc, the, I guess the, the title of my message tonight is I'm going to be exposing the no, no conviction, no conversion heresy. I had somebody not too long ago, they were criticizing a friend of mine. That's a preacher who doesn't believe that. Now I'm like, what are you even talking about? You know, and he explained that you know doctrine to me briefly. I'm like, well, that's just ridiculous. He shouldn't believe that. He should he shouldn't be teaching that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, where do you get this stuff from? Where is this stuff coming from? And so I do. You know, I keep an eye on the camp meeting crowd because it's pretty entertaining. And I went and I watched. You know, I watched a sermon 
uh, by a guy from down, down south, down in South Carolina. And he preached a message called No Conviction, No Conversion. And I was, and I was like, oh, uh, you know, I, I need to listen to this. I need to actually hear a whole sermon on this. And I listened to it. And I was just disgusted by the fact that this was a Baptist church. I could not believe what I was hearing. And so what is the no conviction, no conversion heresy? Well, let's go ahead and go to John chapter 16. Because you know what? Every, you know, every false doctrine, you know, it comes from somewhere. Okay. And what they do, what this crazy Southern crowd does, they love to take one verse or even one phrase and just run with it. And just make it mean whatever they want it to mean. And it's not how we're supposed to, you know, teach the Bible. We're supposed to look at context. We're supposed to not, you know, we should look at several verses. And you know something I've been talking about doing around here? that I'm, We're doing it. From, from here on out, we're doing it. A lot of other churches do this. And after I've seen some of the junk I've seen and some of the false, bad doctrine I've been hearing, I'm like, yeah, we're doing this. And this is, this is necessary. We need to do this. But a lot of churches before the preaching... Whatever the pastor's preaching on, they'll have somebody get up and they'll read that whole chapter. Now, that might bore some of you. You know, listen to a whole chapter get read. But do you realize that is important because preachers today are getting up, they're reading one little text verse, and they're taking it completely out of context. All you'd have to do is read the verses before and verses after, and you would see that this is false. But unfortunately, nobody's taking the time to do that. And the pastor didn't even do it when he studied his Bible. And I do, I, I try to do my best to make sure before I use scripture or anything, I look at context, but I don't always, you know, read all the verses. And so we need to make this a practice one to help keep me accountable. And two, just, you know, so you guys, I know you're keeping an eye on me. Hey, if I'm going to take that verse, I better make sure I'm interpreting it right. Cause we're going to read that whole chapter and the people in my church aren't stupid if they read the whole chapter, they're going to see that I'm completely taking that out of context. And so let's read John chapter 16 and verse 7. And he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And right there, this me- I think this was the only verse the guy used in the whole passage. And notice that part in there where it says, when the Comforter comes, which we know is the Holy Spirit, notice what it says, He will reprove the world of sin. No conviction, no conversion. And some of you in here today, you know, you think you're saved, but you never got convicted. If you never got convicted, and there's no conversion. You're not really saved. But this, that, I'm telling you, that's a false teaching right there. That is completely false. And we're going to go through those scripture, you know, that scripture in a little bit and look at what it actually says. But they do. They completely misuse John 16 and they just take that one verse, that one phrase where it says it will reprove the world of sin. And they stop right there and then they just say, this is what that means and they run with it. You are not allowed to do that. You interpret scripture with scripture. But imagine taking that verse when there's multiple verses where it says, you know, it's whosoever believeth on him. And conviction is not mentioned. Whoever believeth in him. And conviction is not mentioned. And to take that verse where it says he'll reprove the world of sin. And notice, I might get ahead of myself here, but notice it says he's going to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Notice what it says. When he reproves them of their sin, what sin is it? The sin of unbelief. Well, what is it that we teach a person has to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But they're saying, no, you know, you got to get convicted. You got to be feeling bad. You got to be crying. You got to be sobbing. You know, you got to be crawling across broken glass. They don't, they don't say that, I'm good, but slightly exaggerating there. But they, they do. But the crazy thing about that, they'll make this big deal about conviction. But, you know, conviction is only in the Bible. It's only mentioned in the Bible one time. John chapter 8, verse 7. And they're like, you got to have Holy Ghost conviction if you're going to get saved. Amen. 
Holy Ghost conviction. If you didn't have that Holy Ghost conviction come upon you, if you didn't feel something inside of you and just, I mean, be crying and just go run into that old fashioned altar and just pour your heart out to God, I'm telling you right now, you never got saved. And they make it sound so good too. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But is that biblical? Is that what the Bible teaches? But John, and they no conviction, no conversion. Well, if conviction is so important, I would think the Bible would talk about it quite a bit, wouldn't it? Because we teach believing on Christ is really important, and that's mentioned a lot. But in John chapter 8, verse 7, it says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. We all know the story. The woman's taken in adultery. They want to stone her. The famous words, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted, that's the only time you see the word in the Bible. Or see the word convicted in the Bible. They're being convicted by the Holy Ghost. No, it says by their own conscience. Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. That's the only time we see that word in the Bible. And they weren't convicted by the Holy Ghost. They were convicted by their own conscience. So why would we make such a big deal and tell people they're not saved if they didn't get Holy Ghost conviction. And, you know, okay, well, what is Holy Ghost conviction? And good luck getting a straight answer from these people on that because they go all over the place. I'm going to show you some of the things that this man said in this message. But, you know, notice though, when it's in John 16, he said he's going to reprove the world of sin. Okay? You know, they're always like, you know, reprove, rebuke, exhort. You know, reprove, and rebuke, they're both negatives, right? But, you know, reproof doesn't necessarily have to be that negative of a thing, okay? For example, you know, if I ask you how to do something and, and like, hey, you know, if I'm, tr I'm trying something out, maybe I'm trying something on my computer and I'm like, hey, is this how you do it? And you say, no, it's actually this way. You know what you did? You just reproved me. It, now... If you reprove me in something like that, you know, I've been having trouble and that fixed it at work, I'm going to be happy that you reprove me, aren't I? I'm going to like that reproof, okay? It's reproof is not always, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Now we've got, you know, we got the millennial generation that you're not allowed to correct, you know, you're not allowed to mark their tests wrong with red ink and things like that. They don't handle reproof very good, but you know, wise people, they don't mind reproof. You know, reproof, it doesn't have to make you feel bad. And sometimes reproof, it brings relief, doesn't it? Sometimes it will even bring you joy. And that's why we call the gospel, the gospel, which means good news. You know, if we're supposed to bring Holy Ghost conviction on people, have them crying, I mean, just have them feeling so guilty they're ready to hang themselves, but they call on the Lord instead. You know, if that's what we were supposed to do, then, you know, why would the Bible call it good news? Because when you're bringing good news, isn't that something that's supposed to make people happy? I and mean, one of the things that we see quite a bit, not all the time, but when we go out soul winning, when people find out they don't have to work their way to heaven, a lot of them are really happy. A lot of them are relieved when they find that out. We ask a lot of people, hey, if you die, do you know 100% sure that you go to heaven? And they're like, well, I, I, I don't really know. You know, I mean, you know, I, I haven't been in church in a long time. You know, I have, you know, I, I've, I've done this, I've done that. And when you tell, explain to them, that salvation is about faith in Christ, that it's not by the works, many people are happy about it. And they get excited and they take it as good news. Now, there is a crowd that gets upset when you tell them that. And who is that crowd usually? It's the religious crowd. Those people that are trying to work their way to heaven and they've been trying to work their way to heaven their whole lives. But when they hear that, they get upset, don't they? But many people, usually the ones who get saved... When you reprove them and say, well, you know what? It's not about works. You say it gently. Reproof. It's not the works. It's about faith in Jesus Christ. They're usually happy. They, they're, it's, it's relief. Sometimes people might cry for joy, but you know, not everybody responds the same. And the gospel, it's good news. And what is the good news? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that I can receive salvation for free. Because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so many respond with joy or relief when they find out they don't have to earn eternal life. 
in the religious, they'll respond with scorn because you're telling them you spent your life working for nothing. And they don't like to hear that many times. But you know, at the same time, you think that it's still good news that we're bringing them because you know what? If you will cease from your labors, the Bible says it's called entering into his rest. They that enter into his rest have ceased from their labors. Wouldn't that be good? You know, wouldn't you, wouldn't you be thrilled if you found out, hey, you know what? You've been doing it all wrong. All your life that you've been working for a living, turns out retirement's the answer. Just retire and you're taken care of, you know? I mean, boy, we'd all be thrilled if we found that out in our job. But, you know, that's not the way it works with, you know, making money. But that is how it works when it comes to salvation because it's about faith in Jesus Christ. And as we, we cease from our labors, that's good news. And, but, you know, and everyone, the Bible teaches very clearly that all who are going to be saved, they need to come like a little child, which is by faith. Uh, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 16 talks about that. But then Matthew 18, verse 3 says, And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So you got to come like a little child. And you know, I mean, little kids... Man, there's people out there today teaching a lot of the same crowd are teaching, you know, little kids can't get saved because they can't repent of their sins because they're not bad enough yet. It's like, you got to let them, you got to make them wait for a while so they can get in some trouble so they can do some really bad stuff that they can repent of later so they can be saved or because, you know, they won't say so they can do some really bad things, but you know, you have to have conviction, right? I mean, we know you have to be convicted. So we got to wait till they do some things really bad that they can feel bad about. You know, just pulling their hair, sister's hair, that's not going to be enough. You know, they've got to do something really... I mean, it's just the most ridiculous garbage that's being taught out there. And there are people... I mean, we got people today, preachers today, you got the David Clowns and people like that saying that, you know, little kid, you know, you shouldn't try leading your little child to the Lord. But the Bible says, except you come as a little child. So if it's easier for a child to get saved, wouldn't we try reaching them while they're young? While they're still little, why would we wait? That's just ridiculous. I, I know where that teaching comes from. That comes from the devil himself. He definitely would teach that because he knows the longer they wait, the harder it's going to be. And so, there, you know, there's, there's many ways people can respond and no one's emotions are going to be exactly the same. You know, but the one thing the Bible emphasizes over and over again is you must believe. As that happens, you know, these camp meeting preachers, they get up, you know, and they'll read one little verse of scripture. And then, you know, they're walking all over the place. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you about what I used to do. And when I got saved, man, it just, you know, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I felt like I was just going to die if I didn't get over this sin in my life. And I finally just called out to Jesus and I cried like a baby. And I got to that. I went and I got in that baptistry as fast as I could. I practically baptized myself. I wanted to obey God. I wanted to get in church and I wanted to serve him. And let me tell you, folks, some of you out there, you come to church on Sunday and we can't find you until the next Sunday. I'm telling you something's wrong with you. I don't think you got the same salvation I got. And it, it's just, you know, it sounds great. Sound, but it's a bunch of garbage. That is not what the Bible teaches. And so, some of the heresies of this no conviction, no conversion doctrine. And first, is they teach that if you never got, if you if you never changed, you never got saved. Okay? And turn turn to Second Corinthians five seventeen. Second Corinthians five seventeen. You know, and they've always got a verse to go to that they can take out of context. And you know, this is a side note. I might I, I might just preach a message on this, but. These camp meeting preachers, okay? I watched one guy that got up. He was like dancing in his sermon and all this stuff. He was so excited. But, you know, he gets up there. as oh, you know, good to be in the house of the Lord. You know, open your Bibles to the book of Jude. And he never read the verse. He's like, yeah, I'm going to mind the Holy Ghost tonight. And he's walking around. But then he finally needs to get to the Bible. So he's like down there and he, get, he takes somebody's Bible. He, he's like, but beloved. Oh, we got some beloveds here, don't we? You know, and he's walking around I me, mean, just going on. And then later he got, you know, building on your most holy faith. He didn't even get through a whole verse. And the whole message where the Spirit of God just fell and he was dancing and people were jumping and shouting and hollering and screaming. They didn't even get through one verse of the Bible. And they're saying the Holy Spirit showed up. 
And this is nothing but just a big exhibition. That stuff is so easy to do. You know, you know how easy it is to preach like that? I mean, give me one. Somebody give me a verse. Somebody give me a verse right now. Come on, somebody give me a reference. Make, all right, make, it, make it one that's rare. All right. No, you've got, you got to give me a reference. All right, Give me a reference. All right, Just, it, just any reference. I could do Jesus wept. John 11.35. Turn your Bibles to John 11.35. John 11.35, I tell you, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'd rather be here than the nicest jail in the county. I'd rather be here than the best hospital this side of the Mississippi. I'm telling you, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Turn in your books to John 11.35. Notice what it says, Jesus. Hey, man, that's what it's all about right there, ain't it, folks? We're all here about Jesus. I thank God for the cross. I thank God for Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit's falling right now, isn't it, folks? Getting excited, you know? Wait, you know, wait, ladies start waving their hankies, all that kind of stuff, you know? Notice what it says, Jesus wept. Oh. I wonder if Jesus is crying tonight because of some of y'all's lack of faith. I wonder if Jesus is weeping tonight because some of y'all, you didn't put anything in the offering plate. I wonder if Jesus is weeping tonight because you haven't been soul winning. You haven't done nothing for the Lord. I wonder if Jesus is weeping tonight because y'all, y'all are making me laugh, right? <laughs> That's what they do. I don't even think they study for their messages. They just, they, you know how easy that is? I could preach like that. All, and you probably you all would love it, right? I can tell you're enjoying this. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe I could get a crowd if I start doing that stuff. Maybe, maybe these camp meeting preachers know what they're doing. And half the time you see them, they're raising money. You know, we got to raise money, keep this camp going. We need this camp where we're teaching this. No conviction, no conversion heresy. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Where was I? Second Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 517. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let me tell you something. If you didn't change when you got saved, you didn't get saved. There needs to be different. And they got that verse, but they take, once again, they take that out of context. I preached that, that whole passage the other day. And this new creature is not one that's without sin. It's one whose sins are not imputed unto him. One who does not have these things held against him. That happens because of the blood of Christ. He is what changes us. And so they do, they teach that, you know, and he, one of the things he's, this guy said in the message, he's like, you might need to banish that empty, flimsy profession that never altered your life. That empty, flimsy profession that never altered your life. Well, here's the problem with that statement. You ought to alter your life after you get saved. Okay. And even if you are saved, you've been saved for a long time, you need to keep altering your life and trying to become more and more like Christ. But do you understand if you teach people that, you know what they're going to start looking to find out if they're saved? At their works. They're going to start looking at their works. Well, how, how can I know I'm saved? Well, did you change your life? Well, now salvation is about our works, isn't it? Instead of the faith and what Jesus Christ did for us. And that's exactly what's happening to these people. And so, you know, my question for these people is are you no longer a sinner? You know, do you think that God is not bothered by your little sins? Okay, you're not doing the drinking and you know smoking and cussing and all that stuff anymore. But you know, how about pride? Pride's what got Lucifer thrown out of heaven. Well, you know, how about not loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? The greatest commandment. Every one of us break that on a regular basis. But they're like, no, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. And then they give a list of sins that if you didn't change, you didn't really get saved. And they have now made salvation about works. People are no longer looking in the word of God. It's no longer about their faith in Jesus Christ. It's, have I changed? Have I cleaned my act up good enough? Have I repented of enough sins? And so this is, it's ridiculous. You know, God is not, God is not impressed with any of us. And you know, I just like to ask these people, you know, what is it like not to have to deal with pride anymore? Because I'm assuming, because we know God hates pride, but apparently in your world, a person who's truly been converted, can truly been born again, is somebody who's not going to have any problems with sin. And so I'm assuming, you know, you're acting like you're saved, but it, it's, it's a bunch of garbage. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 2. In verse 21, it says, Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest that a man should steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou to the poorest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? 
Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profited, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? Right here, what it's saying is if you who say, you know, you're making your boast in the law. Well, do you realize, and it's specifically, he was talking about the circumcision. If you're going to make a big deal about that, you realize you're required to keep the whole law. And are you a transgressor of the law? Have you failed in any part of the law? And any of us that are honest, we're going to say, yes, we have failed in the law. And you know what? Since we've been saved, all of us, including these camp meeting preachers, they haven't totally kept the law either. And so what are they doing making their boast in the law? Bragging about their changed life and making other people feel like they're not saved because they're not as good as them. Well, let me ask, I'd like to ask these preachers, are you as good as Jesus Christ right now? Because if you're, unless you're as good as Jesus Christ, unless you're holy and without sin, I don't think you ought to go around using yourself as proof of what a saved person is. Uh, you know, or you're using yourself as proof of righteousness. Our proof of righteousness is Jesus Christ. God doesn't look at my righteousness. He looks at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I received Jesus' righteousness when I accepted His gift of salvation. And so, you know, it would be foolish for me to stand up here and talk about myself and use myself as an example of what a Christian is. And as somebody who really is saved and then try to make you doubt whether or not you're saved just because you don't measure up to me. You know how foolish that is? But that is exactly what these people are doing. And so that new creature, it's one whose sins are not imputed unto him. To wit, in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That is what the new creature is. We are made out of the same vile flesh that the world is made out of. We sin like the world sins. But the difference is we are a new creature. We are one that has been washed in the blood and our sins are not imputed unto us. And you know what? I think it's a disgusting blasphemy to imply that your little bit of reformation that you had in your life somehow adds up to what Christ did on the cross. We're not supposed to glory in ourselves. We're supposed to glory in the cross. And you ought to have some reformation in your life. But for you to take that and to use that as proof of salvation, that's ridiculous. And it just flies in the face of what salvation is. No, we call to the Lord because we can't save ourselves. Because we can't be good enough. We can earn heaven. And God told us all we've got to do is put our faith in Him. And that's what we do when we call on the Lord for salvation. And then to add stuff to it like that, is, I mean, just a horrible, disgusting blasphemy. I was listening to a, uh, watching a video clip somebody put up promoting the soul winning marathon, and it had a clip from Jack Hiles on there. And I love what he said on there. I want to read this quote to you because it's so good. He said, if we will put our faith in Jesus Christ, God will see that faith and count it for righteousness, transferring all our sins on Jesus and imputing his righteousness to us. What that means is the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God sees Jesus with your sins and he sees you with his goodness. And that statement is so biblical right there. He sees us with his goodness. That is the thing these people can't figure out. That God, when he looks at us, he sees us as righteousness. But it's not because of our works. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ. God sees us with Jesus' righteousness, not our own. And for us to just get up and, and to brag on that and to boast on a little bit of reformation we had in our life. Yeah, we got rid of a few bad habits. You know, we changed some behavior. That's great if you did that. That'll help you have a better life on earth. It'll help you have a better testimony. But that is not salvation. And to take you 
And to make every other people think they're not saved because of that is as wicked as all get out. And I hate it. It makes me sick. It, it absolutely disgusts me to see these people do that. But, you know, they'll say things like, so do you, and you pay attention to what I'm about to say here because it'll, it'll freak some people out. But I mean what I'm about to say here. You know, they'll say things like, you know, do you think Jesus saved you just so you could go continue living a life of sin and then go to heaven? And you know what my answer is to that? I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm not going to be political about this. I'm just going to answer this straightforward. Do I think that Jesus saved me so I can continue to live a life of sin and still go to heaven? You know what my answer to that is? Yes. Yes. What? Are you serious? Well, here's the thing I question I have for you. What makes you think you're not living a life of sin? So when did, once again, when did you quit sinning? You're still living a life of sin right now. And you can't go from here on out without sinning because we have, we're in this vile bodies. And so, uh, yeah, uh, he saved us so we could continue to live a life of sin and still go to heaven. But that is not God encouraging us to sin. Of course, the Bible doesn't, you know, God doesn't want us to sin. He wants us to do right. But just because God didn't take away earthly consequences for sin, did he? We deal with earthly consequences, don't we? We definitely do when we sin. And so we ought to stay away from those things. It doesn't please God. And we're going to have problems on earth if we do these things. But God knew that we couldn't live a life without sin. And he loved us anyway. He paid for our sins. He gave us his Holy Spirit. And now we don't have to sin. But we do. And if we do, the Bible says, if any man sin... And when it says if there, you know, it, it's not saying, you know, if by some strange, you know, happening in some strange circumstance, you sin. No, we all need this verse every day. It says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Y'all see that God Love, he loved us, even though we were sinners. He said, I'll save them, even though they, they can't live a perfect life. They'll never be like my son, but I'm gonna, I'll save them anyway. I love them anyway. He sent his son and he paid for our sins. And what God has required of us is that just that we receive the free gift of salvation by faith and without works. And I'm not encouraging anybody in here to just go shoot people because, you know, you're saved and you can go murder everybody and still go to heaven. I'm obviously not encouraging that. But understand that just because you're not murdering people doesn't mean you're not living a life of sin. Just because you're not robbing banks doesn't mean you're not living a life of sin. We all sin every day. So what's wrong with these people? They'll say these things like that, like they're not living a life of sin. Like God's not disgusted. By the pride in their life. God's not disgusted by their arrogance. God's not dis, you know, disgusted by their dirty minds. And they do. And they, they turn these things. Why? Because they got to find some way to make other people measure up to them. And that's just foolish. And that is not what it's all about. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under, uh, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And they like to bring that up. And they say, God forbid, like that means it can't happen. Those of you that think you can just sin and frustrate the grace of God, God forbid. God's not going to let you do that. Well, you know, here's another God forbid for you. Okay? Because it's like they will use that like a saved person can't do that. No, it's just saying God forbid. You know, don't let them do that. But it doesn't mean they can't do that. It doesn't mean they don't do that sometimes. Because proof right here, proof that God forbid doesn't mean that God's going to forbid it or that it can't happen is it says in Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Okay, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. What have I been talking about? What is it these camp meeting people do? They glory in themselves. You know, God forbid that they do that. God forbid that they would glory in themselves and in their reformation and their change life and make it salvation about that. God forbid. Okay, you know, we don't want this to happen. It's not good, but it's happening. And it's happening by these people. And I'm not going to say that everybody that does that isn't saved like they would do, but I will say that they are really backslidden, that they have forgotten they were purged from their old, old sins and it had nothing to do with their works. But one of the things this preacher said, 
He said, you need to throw out that emotional decision that you made at the, that revival meeting. Because if that decision didn't make a change in your life or alter the destination of your life, then it was probably because there was never any conviction to which he gets a whole bunch of amens. And, you know, the, and here's the thing that got me when he said that. And, and it caused a big question to come in my mind that he ends up answering. And the answer was horrifying. But, you know, the problem with this is that he's, he's saying, you know, get over that emotional decision. Well, if I get convicted, if I'm feeling really bad for my sins, if I'm feeling really sorry for my sins, is, shouldn't that cause me to get emotional? So I can't get saved unless I have conviction. But if I have emotion, it probably wasn't real. You know Come on, which is it, please? Can you please let me know, you know, which one it is? And, and he tells us how we can know. And it's it's scary, but you know that this you know that it's going to cause me. And so, if we're supposed to make an emotional, not supposed to make an emotional decision, and if we're supposed to be deeply convicted and crying about the fact that we're a sinner, you know, how are we supposed to know if we're saved? And so they they teach. These people are basically teaching. I'm going to get to the answer game in a little bit, but these people they teach that if you're not like, basically if you're not like them, you're not saved. Now understand this stuff. You know, you know it's not new. Okay, now we've been fighting with this multiple gospel crazy Ruckmanite stuff. We've been exposing a lot of this junk, and people, you know, it's like, you know, why does the Lord let these people walk the face of the earth? Well, as long as there's a devil, there's always going to be Judaizers. As long as there's a devil, there's always going to be false doctrine. As long as there's a devil, there's going to be people preaching a work salvation, multiple gospels, all that junk. As long as there's a devil, that's going to be going on. But you know what? God gave us a Bible to combat that stuff. And we just need to keep preaching the truth. It's not going to go away. But in Acts 15, verse 1, uh, look look at what it says there. Uh, I didn't have it in my notes. Let me turn there. Acts 15 and verse 1. This is, this is like, basically, I think a camp meeting was going on here when this happened. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. You all see that? If you don't do this work of the law, you're not saved. And this is, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but in Galatians 6.12, I believe uh, Paul is actually answering, he, this is a reference to that very thing. He says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only, lest they should suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. We see here that they are, they're wanting to have these people all do these things, so they could glory in their flesh. And what these preachers are doing is they got to find some way to get everybody doing what they're doing so they can brag. Look at how all my church dresses. You know, look at how you know, all my people, I have just as big of a crowd on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. You know, look at my church. Look at how, you know, look at how great it is. And they glory in your flesh. That's exactly what's going on there. And so, you know, he's one of the things he said, he said, some of you in here, we see today, but we won't see you again till next Monday or next Sunday morning. There's something wrong with that. If the same Holy Ghost that lives in you lives in me, then why don't you want to go back on Sunday night and Wednesday night? So now you're not saved if you don't go to church on Sunday night and Wednesday night. I think you ought to go to church all the time. But, you know, just because people don't doesn't mean they're not saved. You know, many, the reason many people don't want to is because they're walking in the flesh. That's their problem. Galatians 5.16 through 18. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another, that ye cannot do the things that ye would, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. It's possible for us to save people to walk in the flesh. And if we do that, we're going to fulfill the desires of the flesh. But we're supposed to walk in the Spirit, and there's a lot of saved people that are walking in the flesh. And so nowhere in the Bible does it teach 
that after salvation, the lust of the flesh go away. There's nowhere it teaches that in the Bible that your, the, all your lust goes away. And you know, many parents, they think all they need to do to get well-behaved kids is get them saved. You know, they, they get their kids in church, which is great. They, you know, they do all these things to try to teach them right, thinking I just got to get them saved and they won't want to do bad things anymore. And then all of a sudden, you know, Junior becomes a teenager and he starts noticing that girls are pretty and instead of having cooties and he starts maybe struggling with some things and then they're like sending him to youth conference trying to get him saved and stuff again. You know, he gets a little bit rebellious. Oh, you know, why is Junior rebellious? You know, what's, what's wrong? And it's like they think he needs to get saved again or he's not saved. No, you know what your problem is with your boy? He doesn't have any character or discipline. You need to tr- do some training. You need to train him. You need to teach him right from wrong. You need to teach him how to say no to some things and just how to have some character and some self-control. And a lot of Christian parents are not teaching their kids that. And as a result of that, you know, they have kids that are struggling with these things. And so, you know, just because you're saved does not mean you have character. And we've got these, these people, some of the stuff they're teaching... It's just, it's, it's like they think that salvation automatically makes you disciplined, automatically gives you character, makes it so you're not going to want to sin. We still have this pathetic, vile flesh and it's going to take work. And that's why we got to walk in the spirit. So we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, meaning we won't do the things our flesh wants to do because our flesh is still going to want to do it. So it is, it's, it's a bunch of garbage they're teaching here, but then this teaching, it causes people to, it, it causes them to look at themselves for evidence of salvation instead of looking to Jesus Christ and his word. So that, you know, this, and this is where he ends up giving the answer to how you can know you're saved because you got to have conviction. You know, you got to be feeling bad, but you can't have any emotion because you might make an emotional decision that doesn't really count. So how, how can I even know? All right, because man, maybe I didn't feel that bad when I got saved. You know, so I don't know. Maybe I didn't have Holy Ghost conviction. But maybe you felt really bad when you got saved and you feel like, oh, maybe I, that was an emotional decision. You know, so how, how am I supposed to know? Well, it, they teach you basically to look inward. And I'll, I'll give you a quote here in a minute. But in 1 Corinthians 2 1, it says, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know what Paul wanted to find out about these people with Christ in them? I, don't, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He didn't come in saying, I want to see your changed lives. When was the last time some of y'all drank? When was the last time y'all went to the movies? When was the last time, you know, whatever? He didn't do those things. Let me see how y'all are dressed. Let me check out your church attendance. How has that been going? You know, when was the last time you read your Bible? When was the last time you know, won somebody to Christ? When, you know, he didn't do any of those things. What did he do? He said, I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the work that Jesus did on the Christ. But this crowd, they're teaching people, no, you need to look at yourself. And you know what he kept saying? He kept saying, the greatest evidence of my salvation is what is happening today. That's what, that's what he said many times in that message. He said, the best evidence of my salvation is what is happening today. But here's the problem. Today, I still struggle with sin. Today, I still have failures. I sometimes break the greatest of all commandments, and I don't love the Lord like I should. And my salvation is not based on my works, my reformation, my religion. It's based completely on the work of Jesus Christ. And the evidence that I am saved, the Bible says, is in His blood. We are justified by His blood. That's my evidence. I'm not going to bring my works. When I stand before God, I'm not going to bring my works. I'm not going to tell Him about my changed life. Jesus Christ is going to go to bat for me, and His blood is what's going to get me in. His, that is payment for my sin. And so you'll never see me dancing about my changed life like some of these guys do. I mean, literally dancing about their change, you know, because of their changed life. You know, I'm too busy looking for that blessed hope, which is not just sitting around waiting for the rapture. I'm looking for that blessed hope when my vile body is changed into a body like his glorious body. And one of the things he said, he said, I want somebody to take a Bible 
and show me where I have to go back to the time and the place and the hour of when I got saved. He showed, he said, show me where I have to have the preacher. He said, the evidence of my salvation is not what I prayed in 1976. The evidence of my salvation is what is happening today. Look at me preaching this day in this church. Packed house. Big church. Look at me. I'm definitely saved. I'm the pastor. That is so wrong. It's so ridiculous. And these, these, these questions, you know, I'll, I'll give him some verses. You know, because first of all, you know, he said, show me in the Bible where I have to go back to the time and the place and the hour when I got saved. Now, I'm not saying if you forgot the date or something, I'm not saying you're not saved. But you know what? You ought to know when the time was and when the place was. Okay, for example, Jesus said you must be born again. Well, none of us remember when we were born, but we all know what happened, didn't we? Don't we? We all know that we were that we were born and we know the date and we celebrate the birthday and all those things like that. Because it's a pretty significant event when you're born. And it's a pretty significant event when you are born again. And being born again, it's not a process, it's an event. It's something that happens. And being born again, it happens when we Call on the Lord for salvation when we believe on Him. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that a process or is that an event? And the Bible says also, How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And he's like, you know, show me where I have to have a preacher. Well, Romans 10, 14 tells you you have to have a preacher. Okay, it's an event. It's a time. It's when you received that gift of salvation. Many of us in here today, we have gifts. That we have things that we received. I can tell you when I received it. You know, I'm wearing a wedding ring. This ring was given to me on April 20th of 2001 at my wife and I's wedding. Okay, her ring she's wearing. It was given to her six months before that when we got engaged. It was an event where there was something that was given to her. And when we got saved, that was a time when we accepted that free gift of salvation. And we accepted it by faith, believing on the work of Jesus Christ for salvation. And yeah, that's an event. That's not a process. And our salvation, the Bible teaches, it, it came by faith and it was not of works. And so to say that the best evidence of your salvation is in what you're doing today, well, what happens if I get backslidden? You know what? I'm going to be, man, I must not be saved. And I'm going to go get saved again. Thinking that I'm not saved because I haven't been good enough. So now my salvation and my new profession is clearly works based again. If I wasn't saved before, I'm still not saved. And so, you know, you know how did you receive that free gift? You know, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But he's telling you, know, look, what, what are you doing today? That's a bunch of garbage. See, he, one of the things he said, he was saying, if you are a wife and you're struggling to obey your husband, but you say you got saved at six, I doubt it. That's what he said. You know, my wife, I think I got for my wife, she's a submissive wife, great wife. But you know what? Submission doesn't come naturally to her. She, you know, she's not naturally submissive okay and you know there's it, it's a struggle all right it doesn't mean she's not saved okay it's just part of her nature okay you know she takes after her mom a little bit you know i mean you know she you know she she inherited she inherited some things doesn't mean you're not saved just means you're not right with god and to tell some woman because you're mean to your husband and you back talk your husband you're probably not saved what is he telling you to base your salvation on your works and on your changed life? And the Bible does not teach that. And so, you know, oh, and after the service, they got the whole invitation on there. A lady ends up coming forward and she, she came, went to the preacher, said she got saved. And he's like, you wasn't before. And she said, not based on my works. Right there. I wasn't saved before. And, you, and this wasn't a, a visitor. You could tell she was one of the church ladies. But well, she got convicted, you know. She would probably been mouthing off to her husband right before service. Oh, man, I'm not saved. And so what does she do? She goes forward, gets saved again, thinking, 
I've got to be a submissive wife. I don't know what her issue was. But you all realize that's called repenting of your sins right there, okay? You can't repent of your sins. You know what's going to happen? A week from now, her husband's going to tell her something she doesn't want to hear. And you know what she's going to do? She's going to mouth off to him again. She's going to get in the flesh. And then she's going to have to go to church again and get saved again. Man, I've tried it. I've gotten saved 20 times. And I still struggle with you know, submitting to my husband. Okay? Because you don't get saved like that. And that is what these people are doing. This is why teenagers, they go to youth conferences every year. And they get saved every year. Because, oh man... Everything the preacher preached against, you know, I did. You know, I watched Twilight. You know, I did, you know, I did, you know, played this video game, right? I listened to Taylor Swift or whatever. I did all those things. And it's because, you know, they have no discipline in their life. It's because they have no character. It's not because they're not saved. And instead of going and confessing their sin, instead of going coming clean to their parents and telling their parents, you know what, you can't trust me with the cell phone. You can't trust me with the computer. You can't trust me with those things. You know what they do? They just go and get saved again, saying, all right, clean slate. That was when I was lost. Now I don't have to tell my parents about it. But the problem is they get away from youth camp. They lose conviction because there's not a preacher yelling in their face. And then two weeks later, they're doing it again. And then next year, they got to go get saved again. I mean, you know, how can you can't have victory in Christ with this kind of teaching? Because you're not even going to get saved if this is what you're taught. You know, true victory, it, co- it comes when we know that we're saved. We know that God loves us no matter what, that our salvation is secure in Him, and it should cause us to love Him and want to walk in the Spirit and say, you know, Lord, help me control myself. Lord, help me have some character. And it ought to cause you to, you know, care about God enough that you might have to go to your parents and say, you know what, I am, I'm pathetic, I'm worthless. You can't trust me with these things. Ground me. I need you to ground me from my cell phone. Boy, that, you know, that would take some character right there. But you know what? If that's what you got to do, that's what you need to do. And don't go and make, don't go and get saved again, thinking clean slate, now I don't have to tell my parents what I was doing. That's not even going to work. Because now you're thinking, in order to be saved, I can't ever do those things again. But those temptations are going to keep coming. Okay? Teenagers got to deal with a lot of temptation. And during the invitation, he's doing that with all these boys. You know, your boy, you know, he's like calling out all these things that teenagers do. Like, you can't really be, be saved. And, it's just, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this is a big church. I don't know how many people are in this church. But I'm like, you know what? Everybody in that church is struggling with, with the stuff that he's talking about, if they're honest. And really, if you stop and think about it, they should have had about 200 people go forward and get saved you know, by that plan of salvation. I guarantee you there's at least 50 women in that church that didn't submit to their husbands that week. But only one went forward to get saved. I guarantee every teenager in that church struggled with those things, but none of them went forward to get saved. But, you know, he's got a cover for that. You know, one of the things he said, he said, you know, 17 or 18 people getting saved at one time has always worried me. Because then it just looks like an emotional decision. You know, people are just hopping on the bandwagon. I think it's a good thing he wasn't at the day of Pentecost. When 3,000 got saved and 5,000 got saved, well, he'd have really been worried there. I mean, something's wrong here. We got 3,000 people getting saved. There's no, no, there's no way they got convicted enough. But that, that just shows how wrong these people are in their salvation. And there is a real problem with teaching, the teaching that you have to have Holy Ghost conviction to be saved. Yes, I agree the Holy Spirit has to draw. The Bible says that. But Jesus said if he be lifted up the earth, he would draw all men unto him. Everybody's going to get drawn at some point. Maybe not when you want it to, you know, but at the same time, you know, he's going to draw everybody. I'm not saying there's salvation without the work of the Holy Ghost, but adding this conviction and teaching people got to be feeling all bad and all that, that. That's a bunch of garbage. You can't add to what John 16 actually says. It's very specific. And what these people teach is very, very confusing. And there's no doubt about it. It's confusing. It's contradictory because it's just downright false. And this teaching, it's nothing more than a tool that pastors are using to control their people. Oh, man, we're struggling financially this week. You know, we, we need a bigger offering. I worry about some of you people that you don't tithe and you say you're saved. The Bible says no thieves are going to enter into the kingdom of God and you, you're robbing God with your tithe. You're not saved. Get up here to the altar right now and either give your tithe or get saved, you know. And if you get saved, you better start giving your tithe. You didn't really get saved. So one way or another, we're going to get your tithe from you, folks. You're going to hell, you know. 
And that's pretty much what these people are. Te- and you can use that with everyone. I had a preacher tell me one time, a person, if they really get saved, they'll at least go to church. I said, you realize if you add any work, you're adding a work to salvation. And so he just says going to church, but then you got other people, well, you'll get baptized too. But then you got these guys. Not only are you going to get saved, you're going to get baptized. You're going to be at church three times a week. You're not going to ever want to, you know, mouth off to your husband. You know, you teenagers, you're never going to think any bad thoughts. You're never going to, you know, look at anything you shouldn't look at. I mean, where is, where is it going to stop? And the truth is, the teaching that you've got to change your life and you've got to be at church all the time and never look at anything wrong, never think a bad thought, never back talk your husband, kids, never back talk your parents. Do you all realize? that that teaching will equally send you to hell, just like teaching that, well, you just have to get baptized. Or you just have to show up for church one time. It, you don't add any works to salvation. When you make that a part of any work, part of salvation, it, it's works-based salvation. And our salvation, it's about our faith in Jesus Christ and the no conviction, no conversion teaching. It is a heresy. It is wrong. I hope the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. I, I hope He does wrong. But here's the thing. If He's doing that, it's because He lives inside of you. Well, we don't get Him inside of us until we get saved. You know, and so it is. It's something that... Uh, it, it's, it's another example of these people taking a little phrase and running with it.